We want to welcome everybody to our Wednesday night services here at the Benton Church of Christ. If you're listening in, listening in on WITB, we'd like to welcome you as well. Uh, tonight, uh, I'll be doing the announcements. Our devotion will be led by Brad Miller, songs uh, by Mike Darnell, and I really have no idea who's doing the opening prayer. So, uh, somebody be ready. That's all I got to say there. Um, as far as our sick are concerned, Ryan Bohannon will have shoulder surgery tomorrow at Lourdes Hospital. And Randy Green, who is the son of Judy Atkins, will be having surgery in Lexington tomorrow. Uh, several, several of you may have already heard or may know uh, Winfred uh, Claiborne. He uh, is a former teacher at Freed Hardman. He's been a speaker for uh, Gospel World Radio. Uh, he is the father of Danny Claiborne, who is the, one of the song leaders at University Church, and he passed away this past Monday and uh, spent a lot of time in many, many pulpits and doing a lot of good work for the Lord. And so just be mindful of that family uh, this week as uh, they are mourning his passing and in the coming weeks. Just general announcements. <clears throat> Those that are going to the Sunshine Youth Rally, the bus will leave at 4 p.m. Friday, November 21st, and will return approximately 5.30 p.m. on Saturday, November 22nd. Sunday night will be our monthly singing and potluck. Uh, those fifth grade and under who would like to lead a song need to see Lonnie, and any uh, person, I guess, that's sixth grade or above needs to see Matt uh, to let, let him know if you're wanting to lead a song. Members, uh, let's see, members who will not have an opportunity to be with their families Thanksgiving Day are invited to a meal at Majestic provided by the church. If you would like to attend, please sign up in class uh, tonight or call the office to let them know, kind of to uh, make your reservation, if you will. Harvest Sunday will be Sunday, November 23rd. We'll be collecting food items uh, to provide holiday meals, you know, bring in items that would be Ideal for, obviously, a Thanksgiving meal. And if you want to make some money donations, you can see Gwen Moss or Sonny Rommelman. And then Sunday, December 7th, kindergarten through fifth grade will do their caroling at Lakeway and at the Stilly House. And after caroling, kids will go to Mr. Gaddy's to eat. And the songs were passed out in class Sunday morning. So if you did not get those songs, I would suggest you ask your youngins. And if uh, you still can't locate them, then talk to Adam or Aaron, and we'll try, or one of us will try to get you a copy of those things. Any other announcements at this time? Do we have somebody for opening prayer? I think I may be down for it anyway. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We're thankful for this opportunity we have to gather together and to worship. We're thankful so much for each and every person in this church who's faithful to you and strives so hard to please you. Father, we pray that you continue to be with us. We pray that you be with our country in the direction our country is headed. We pray that you be with each one of us and help us to be lights in this world and salt for this earth. Please be with all the teachers tonight and help each one of us to gain something from a study of your word that we can apply for the rest of this week. Father, forgive us when we sin. Help us to be better servants of you each and every day. In the name of your Son, we pray, and amen. If you like standing, let's stand together as we sing this song where Brad brings our devotional. Come unto me.
Good evening. Mark Twain was quoted as saying, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. Too often we allow meaningless things of this world to rob us of the joy that God has placed within us. It's been said that happiness is a choice. But too often we allow our happiness to be dictated by circumstances. It's frustrating to see those who call themselves Christians going around as though that they are mad at the world. Certainly there are things in this world, though, that aren't pleasant. But our faith should be stronger than the world. Jesus has said that in this world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Oftentimes, we determine our own circumstances. We can set the tone for our environment. It can be as simple as the smile on our face. I like the reference that a smile is the lighting system of the face, the cooling system of the head, and the heating system of the heart. Some people, when given the choice, however, would rather choose bitterness over happiness. Who would you prefer to be around? That sounds like a silly question. Oftentimes, bitterness and happiness are directly related to our physical and emotional health. In Proverbs 17, 22, we read, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Christians should be the happiest people on earth. We've already been given a victory that Christ has won for us. We're just out doing the victory lap. And God's word tells us how to enjoy our lives while we wait for the day when we will be called home. While there are a number of factors that affect our state of well-being, and some are not always so simple, we do read in Proverbs 16:24 that pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bone. We can control our circumstances, and to a large part, we can control our environment. And one way to do that is to stop giving other people the job of making you happy. If you would like to have the prayers of the church tonight for problems you may have in your life at this time, or you wish to put on Christ through baptism and join the victory laps with the rest of the Christians, then please come while we stand and while we sing.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Oh, uh, me. All right. Good to see everyone. It's like we got plenty of sound and not much PowerPoint. <laughs> I think they're working on that, though. All this technology, it is amazing, isn't it? Amazing what it'll do. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if the word got around or not, but uh, somebody got a letter from uh, a fellow that uh, we met in Groningen back in 95, I guess, or 94 when we all went over there. And he was watching the services of the Benton Church of Christ on live stream. Gerald Vanderwood. Vanderwood, yeah, Gerald. I didn't remember his last name. Gerald Vanderwood. So, Gerald, if you're listening and watching tonight, why, greetings from Benton Church of Christ in Benton, Kentucky. We're glad you're able to watch, and we hope you have a, have a good time with us tonight. All right. Have we got that? That thing may not be going yet. I don't know. Not imperative. It, it works. Anything we need to announce or anything before we start? <laughs> You're not using that thing to mess this one up, are you? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Last week, I want to just, I hope we can finish this lesson tonight and uh, we'll try to end up with the end of this lesson, even if I get through a little early or whatever happens. Uh, next week, we're going to have a devotional on Wednesday night, and uh, a lot of people will be traveling, people will be coming in, people will be leaving and going to visit families for Thanksgiving, and we're glad that they have the opportunity to do that, of course, and so we'll have a devotional on the a lot of the teachers will be gone and things. And so if I can get through this, well, we'll finish. And, and uh, then next week after that, we'll start something different. All right, last week we were talking about the laws of God and what happened in the Garden of Eden. What happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Basically three things. They were changed physically. They were changed spiritually. And they were changed mentally. Okay, They were changed physically. How? Because they, could, they were no longer a perfect being that would last forever. Right? They would die. They were changed physically. They were changed spiritually because what? They lost their, their relationship with God, right? Okay? So they, uh, they were changed spiritually. And they were changed mentally because they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, Mentally, they began to know what? Sin. The difference between good and evil. The difference between right and wrong. Now, how long did those changes last? <laughs> they last forever, didn't they? Okay. Well, you know, we tend to think about that and we think, well, you know, okay, man dies, so, you know, we don't, but we don't think about his spiritual relationship being one that lasted forever and his mental change being one that lasted forever. Adam and Eve could not do anything about their relationship with God, right? What had to happen in order for that to change? 
Jesus. Jesus had to come and give his life and his blood in order that man could reconcile himself with God. Okay, The Garden of Eden, a big, big event in the history of man. Okay, I don't know if I have, I should have had this up if that's, all right, there we go. So then how were they changed physically, mentally, and spiritually? All right, how does it affect us today? We will die, we know good and evil, and we are separated from God when we sin. All right, all began in the Garden of Eden. Then we talked last week a little bit about what sin is. What is sin? Transgression of the law of God, right? Okay, sin is the transgression of the law of God. It is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. All right, that's kind of where we got to last week. And we started to talk about... The three ages are the three, sometimes we call laws of God in the biblical age or in biblical times. What have I got up there? Okay. All right. The first age that we talk about. Now you've been taught this since you were this tall, right? What was the patriarchal age? A time that God spoke to people directly. Okay. Then the Mosaic Age. We talk in terms of beginning at what period, at what event. At the giving of the law on Mount Sinai until the cross, right? And then the gospel age, the age in which we live today, right? The gospel age. Now, I want us to go back and think in particular about the patriarchal age. I think we have long considered the patriarchal age a time when God told people what he wanted them to do. But who did God talk to during the patriarchal age? Did he talk to the head of every family? We don't think he did, at least. We have no record of it, do we? Who did God talk to? He talked to Noah. He talked to Abraham. In fact, when you get to the patriarchs, what were the who were the three patriarchs that we commonly call uh, the men, the names of the men who were the head of the nation of Israel? The three patriarchs were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, patriarchs. So what was this patriarchal age? What was taking place? That's what I want us to talk about mostly tonight is what was taking place during this patriarchal age? It was a period of time from, let's go back if we want to, all the way from Adam to say Moses. And people want to break it up a little differently and that doesn't bother me. I don't care a bit because I'm not sure we know exactly what it is anyway. Did man sin during that period of time? Okay. Now, the key question then is, what law were they breaking? Then he says they weren't. There was no law. He thinks. <laughs> now he's, now he's uh, beginning to second guess that. 
What law were they breaking? Uh, Ad, um, God destroyed several million people during the flood. Why did he destroy them? They were sinful. Oh, well, here we go. All right. All right. I think that's the whole point, Mike, and that's what I hope that we get out of this lesson is that in the Garden of Eden they were changed three ways. How? Physically, spiritually, and mentally. How were they changed mentally? They knew the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil. So, what law then were the people breaking that were destroyed by God? Such as in the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah. They were doing evil because they knew better, right? That's not why they would restate that. Not because they knew better. They knew better, but they were doing evil. Okay. They knew better because God had implanted in their minds the difference between good and evil. So was the law during that period of time, was it a written law? No, it wasn't a written law, was it? Okay, so the key point then is did a law exist? Now, what is, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of law. Right? So what was the law that those people were breaking that condemned them during that period of time? The law of knowledge of good and evil. They knew the difference. And they chose to do evil. All right, Romans 5, 13. If you would like, you can turn in your Bibles to that. And these are some verses that we have discussed over the years, people have asked questions about. We're going to put them in that light and see what we think about them. Romans 5, 13. For until the law... Now, that's talking about the law of Moses. For until the law of Moses came, sin was in the world. Now what does that tell you? When did Moses, when the law of Moses come in? At Sinai? So sin was in the world from Adam to Sinai. Alright, but what was, what was the law that they were under? It wasn't a written law, was it? The law of Moses was the first written law. So it had to be the law of knowledge of good and evil. But sin was not imputed where there is no law. Has there ever been a time when there was no law? Okay, this verse is using that to show that there's not been a time when there was no law. He says, sin was in the world from Adam to Moses. And he's saying that that is true because sin was imputed to those people. Because... If there were no law at that time, there would have been no sin. But there was sin from that time. And then he says in verse 15, uh, 14 of chapter 5 of Romans, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now, what is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. Okay, so they had to sin from Adam to Moses. Right? So death reigned from Adam to Moses. If there was death, there was sin, right? If there was death, there was sin. Because if there were no law, there would have been no sin. But even Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden had a law, right? It was a very, com a very simple one, don't eat of that tree. That was a command from God. All right. Now then, how long, 
How long did the patriarchal age, so-called, we so-call it, last? Patriarchal age to the cross. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's look at the law of Moses first, then we'll back up to that, okay? When did the law of Moses begin? When the law was given. When he went up to Mount Sinai, right? Okay. Who was this law for? It was for the children of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel only. Were there other people on the earth? All right. This seems like uh, things that you would study in the the grade school, and and I apologize for that, but we need to make the point here. The children of Israel, the law of Moses was only for the children of Israel. How long did that law last? Okay, that's, thank you, 1,432 years. I'll take your word for it. I don't know. <laughs> to, I'm going to rephrase my question. <laughs> to what point in time did it cease? <laughs> All right, at the cross, right? Colossians 2.14 says what? It was nailed to the cross. Okay, the law of Moses ended at the cross. That was the point in time in which Jesus had fulfilled everything that was prophesied of him in the Old Testament. Am I right? That was the point in time. The law of Moses ended at the cross. Okay. So there was one nation subject to the law of Moses from the time of Moses to the time of Christ. Now, what law were people under the Gentiles. What law were the Gentiles under at that time? Okay, we're coming back to the patriarchal. Patriarchal is a good term because it talks in terms of speaking to maybe how God directed that period of time. But what was the law? Right and wrong. Good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil. That was the law. Gen- uh, Romans, we're back in Romans. Romans 2.14 For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, These having not the law are a law unto themselves. All right, the Gentiles. We have, during that period of time, we have the Israelites subject to the law of Moses. And then we have all the other people in the world who are called Gentiles. Everybody else is categorized as Gentile. All right, what law were they under? It says here, that they do by nature the things contained in the law. Now, what does it mean to do by nature? It was natural for them. Where where they got that? In the Garden of Eden, God implanted in man what? The knowledge of good and evil. So, for man to know the difference between good and evil. Okay, so he said, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, the law of Moses, are a law unto themselves. Now that's been discussed to eons of time as to what that law was. Well, what was it? It was the knowing the difference between good and evil and doing good instead of evil, right? 
They knew the difference between good and evil. Therefore, that was the law. Now watch what the, now watch what the next verse say, says. Which show the works of the law written in their hearts. Where was that law written? In their hearts or mind as we, you know, the heart, the mind. It was written in their hearts. When was it written there? In the Garden of Eden. It was written there in the Garden of Eden. Those people knew the difference between good and evil. Now look at the next statement. Their conscience also bearing witness. What is your conscience? Recognizing the difference between what? Right and wrong. Good and evil. That's your conscience, isn't it? Now can a man's conscience be, I think the term in the Bible is seared. Can it be seared? Sure. I mean people can, do you think the people in Noah's time, do you think their conscience bothered them? Well I doubt it, seriously. Do you think they knew they were doing wrong? Probably so, but they didn't care. Um, Josh uh, Herndon is teaching our West Kentucky Bible School on Tuesday night, and he made an interesting statement last night. He didn't know I was going to quote him tonight, but I thought it was very interesting. We were talking about the, the uh, account of... Uh, Abraham and Sarah going down into Egypt and uh, Abraham told Sarah, said, you know, if, if a man looks at you and, and uh, for my sake, tell him you're my sister. Well, guess who looked at her? Pharaoh. <laughs> well, that was, that was not a real good thing for, for, uh, to happen to Abraham. But anyway, the point was that when Pharaoh found out that she was married, what did he do? Get out of here. Don't want anything to do with you. Go away. He recognized what? It was wrong to live in an adulterous situation. And Josh said last night, and I'll uh, let you ask him more about it because I couldn't go back into history and prove it, but he said that almost... Every civilization at that point in time, the records show or whatever that people recognized that adultery was wrong. And we know that Pharaoh recognized it in Egypt. So they knew the difference between good and evil. Their conscience was bearing witness of them. So this, this, this verse in Romans 2, 14 and 15 becomes very important. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law of Moses, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. Now what did, what did the law of Moses, what, it says they did by nature the things contained in the law. What's this talking about? They overlap. They overlap. Right, Fred, they overlap. The Ten Commandments. I got Sherry and I, I was reading through my notes here this afternoon. We got trying to figure out if we could still see them. I think we got them after we tried for a while. Yeah, yeah. Sure, they had laws, but those, in most cases, those were civil laws. But they may have included uh, the laws of God. Sure. The difference between right and wrong. But if you look at them, the, what is it, the last five, thou shalt not murder, uh, steal, commit adultery, bear false witness, and covet. Okay. Those, those are the last five. And so what this verse is saying is that they, by nature, did the things contained in the law. They did not murder, or they knew murder was wrong. They knew stealing was wrong. They knew adultery was wrong. 
They knew bearing false witness against your fellow man was wrong and they knew coveting was wrong. That's what they did by nature. It was natural for them because God had implanted in them the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. So by nature, they did things contained in the law of Moses. They knew these things. Now, it's interesting that Do people today, do a lot of people or some people, many people maybe today, do by nature the things contained in the New Testament? Are there many good people out there doing by nature the things that God has commanded, yet they have never been obedient to the gospel? See, there's an answer to a question that you've asked many times. By nature, they understand these things are wrong. And, you know, that's almost the biggest religion we have in the United States today is I'll just be a good person. But God asks more than that, doesn't he? But how do they know what being a good person is? Because God has implant in our hearts the knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong. Okay, now then I'm going to go back to the question I asked and Bill answered a while ago. Let's, I don't care for us calling it the patriarchal age because that's what we've called it all this day, all our lifetime. But what law was in existence during the patriarchal age The law of knowledge of good and evil, right? God didn't go around talking to every household whether they were good or bad or indifferent. He didn't tell the people in Nineveh. He sent Jonah down there. All right, that was out of the patriarchal age, I guess. But uh, he didn't talk to each one of the people out there waiting on the flood. He told Noah to preach to them, didn't he? So the patriarchal age is something that we've always heard But yet we need to understand what law was in existence during that period of time. Just the law of good? No, it was the law of choice, freedom of choice. To obey God or not. The command in the Garden of Eden, we talked about this last week, was not a moral law. It had nothing to do with morality. It had to do with obedience. It was a command, and it it gave man a free will to decide whether he would follow that or not. Okay? All right. Then. Pardon? Well, okay. That's kind of a different subject, but all right. Okay. Now then. There's, a, there's always been a lot of discussion about certain things. Like we come up to the cross and Jesus died and the law of Moses ended. When did the gospel begin? Pentecost. How many days were there? Okay. 50 days past Sunday, right? The resurrection. All right. I have no telling to times in my life I've heard people ask the question, what law were these people under between the cross and Pentecost? You ever hear that question asked? No? My goodness, where you been? <laughs> I always had to heard that question. Those 50 days, those people who died during those 50 days, what happened to them? You ever heard that? Yeah. What law were they under? They were not under the law of Moses. The gospel hadn't been given. Law of knowledge of good and evil. Has there ever been a time when there was not law? That's why Bill said the patriarchal age lasted to the cross or to Pentecost or whatever. But let's, if we'll get it in our minds that it is a law. Now, 
in Acts chapter 10, there's a very interesting account. The account of Cornelius. 1 Peter 3.12 says, most of you know that uh, account of Cornelius. ...of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Whose prayers does the Lord hear? The righteous. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was living after the cross. Yet his prayers went up before God. But God only hears the prayers of a righteous man. Yet Cornelius had never been baptized. Have you ever heard those arguments? Surely you've heard those arguments, those discussions. Why could the prayers of Cornelius be heard? He was a righteous man, but you have to be careful when you say that because he was living under, in, during the gospel age, right? But what about the Gentiles? When was the gospel giving, given to the Gentiles? With Cornelius. The Holy Spirit was sent to that Cornelius household. And the gospel then was given to the Gentiles. To the, the gospel given to the Jew first and then to the Greeks or Gentiles. The Jew first was to Cornelius. Now, why would God hear Cornelius' prayer? law was he under? Come on, sure. He was living under the law of knowledge of good and evil. What law was Noah living under? Knowledge of good and evil. What about Abraham? Knowledge of good and evil. He spoke to those men because they were good. He says Noah was a good man. Abraham was a good man and guess what? Cornelius was a good man. He could speak to him just like he could speak to Abraham or Noah or any of the forefathers, couldn't he? Because he was living under the law of knowledge of good and evil. Now, once they received the Holy Ghost in the house of Cornelius, what's the only option? For everybody, it became what? Baptism. The only way to God. So, we need to understand how this works in order to understand what's going on in the world today. We have a tendency in our society and in the church today to believe that people are lost because they don't believe the Bible. Anybody want to question that? <laughs> All right, that's true to a certain extent, isn't it? All right. The law of Moses contained the moral issues that people needed to follow. Does the gospel contain the moral issues that people need to follow today? Absolutely, but what if people are not following him? Is because they're not? Is it because they haven't become a Christian? Well, that's true, but what law are people breaking today? They're breaking the law of knowledge of good and evil. How long did that law last from Eden? Forever. Now, so it becomes real important that we understand just really what's going on in the world today. I've got a little diagram here for you. Oops, I had a little diagram here for you. And how do I get back to it? 
Anybody know? Helps on the way. I swiped it and it went away. Swiped one step, don't you? I don't know. Evidently. All right, while he's doing that, try and get that back up for me. We need to understand what's going on in the world today. What law are people breaking that's condemning them? The law of knowledge of good and evil. That's the law they're breaking that's condemning them. What is the gospel for? It is for, yeah, all right. I'm going to ease that thing across there a little bit. Now, this is a, you probably have a hard time making this out. But the gospel is the way man can get forgiveness of the sins he's committed under what law? Good and evil. that thing working? It's just not showing up up there. Nobody see it up there? All right. Start with the Garden of Eden on the bottom line. Those people, the people of the world, the population of this world, live under the law of knowledge of good and evil. They have lived under that law since, they, since Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. They will live under that law until Jesus comes again, right? Okay. Now, between the Garden of Eden and, let's say, Moses, there was no written law, was there? So what's, how did God deal with the people? How, did, how come him to like Noah and Abraham? They liked God, right? They were faithful to God. So he picked them out as his leaders and to do the, do the works he bid for them. Then along comes the law of Moses for one nation to follow, but at the same time, what's happening at the bottom? The law of knowledge of good and evil is continuing, right? All right, when did the law of Moses end? At the cross. But what was continuing at the bottom? The law of knowledge of good and evil. Now, what did Jesus do at the cross? He gave us the church, which is where we can do what? Come out from our sins under the law of knowledge of good and evil and come into, through obedience, into what? Into the church. Folks, that's what's going on in the world today. People say, well, you know, they're not a Christian, they're not following the Bible. Well, that's true. The thing that's condemning people today is that they have committed evil, they have done wrong in the sight of God that they knew better than to do. Now how do you, Adam and Eve couldn't get rid of that, could they? But what happened? Jesus came and gave us a way that we could get our, have our sins forgiven under what law? Under the law of knowledge of good and evil. So through the gospel contained. Now remember that the law of Moses contained or 
these people down here were doing things by nature contained in the law of Moses. Do people today do by nature the things contained in the gospel or the Bible? Well, certainly they do. But are they saved? Only when they obey God, obtain forgiveness, and do what? Come into the church. Now, what do we have in the Bible for those who are in the church? All right, We have those moral laws, don't we? Those moral laws are listed in the Bible. You know, no kill, no steal, no commit adultery, and all those things. But what else does the gospel contain? Or the Bible, the, the New Testament? It contains things that God wants His people to do. More than just don't kill, don't steal. He wants you to be kind to one another, to love one another. He wants you to worship Him through singing, praying. Are these people on the bottom line lost because they don't sing to God? No, they're lost because they're doing evil. But when we come into the church, then what do we do? We follow the commands that God has given us where? In the New Testament. That's why it becomes so important for the church to study, understand, and practice what we call New Testament Christianity. Because that's what it's all about. Is us coming into the church and being more than good people, I mean, that's what he wants us to be and not do the evil, but he wants us to be his people, be close to him. And the older we get, the more we practice, the more we read, the more we understand, the closer we can become to him. But we need to get away from the idea that there were three laws. There was patriarchal and mosaical and Christian, and if you're not in the Christian if you're not uh, obedient in the Christian age, you're lost. Well, that's true. But why? You're lost because God implanted the law of knowledge of good and evil in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And it will last forever. And that's what people, there's where people commit sin. So when you're talking to someone who's not a member of the church, their sins that they're committing are those of the law of knowledge of good and evil. Now, if uh, I had one more time, one more verse to read. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Do you know not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, or sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. None of those people are coming into the church, are they? But then the next verse says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. People who come into the church are forgiven of those sins they have committed under the law of knowledge of good and evil. If we keep His commandments, then we remain in a close relationship with Him, just like Adam and Eve had the Garden of Eden. That relationship has been restored. Okay. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your comments. We'll see you in two weeks. No, we'll see you next week. But we'll be back in class week after next.